What did they look like? Completely unknown. We have no genetic, no linguistic, no archaeological evidence to tell you that they were pygmies, that they were short-statured. In fact, biological evidence, as they see it now, says that since this migration, it could have been that populations became shorter by living in the rainforest more. But the fact is, although we don't know what they look like, the Bantu say it was the pygmies. They placed them very strictly as the first comers. They say it was they that they met. Un the pygmies are universally regarded as guides by the Bantu, as their teachers, even sometimes saviors when the Bantu were in need of, in need of aid. And they take this very far for a lot of reasons I won't go into, but they take it so far to say that the pygmies were the first on earth, that, they're the, that they put them in their creation myths as some of the most, as the earliest beings on earth. And they, the Sogo, the Sogo, for example, say that they were first to be sent onto earth by God. And they actually call the pygmies the people who fell from the sky. So this is a very important cosmological idea that shows up um, throughout you know, the region. And when you're watching the film, the footage in their Abuiti, they're talking about Disumba, who is a female ancestor pygmy, who supposedly peopled the whole world. And so there's a lot of mention of Disumba in there. I was happy to see in that footage. She's the, oftentimes they're said to come down in a couple, her and her husband, and they populate the earth. <clears throat> So what is important here about this is that the Bantu, again, are perceiving the Batwa to be first comers on the land and also on earth. They're putting it into their cosmologies. Because of this, in many societies, they are still accorded a certain degree of respect. For example, today and over the past 500 years for documentation we see from Europeans, Batwa or pygmies have had to be present at the installation of political chiefs, at the commencement of ironworking, They've been called upon to cure epidemics and disease for entire communities. They especially are brought in about issues of infertility of people or of land. They are necessary in these rituals because in the Bantu mind, they legitimize them. This is because the Batwa are considered to be the representatives of the spirits of the land. They're associated with the spirits of the land, and they are thus the most capable intercessors with those spirits. In order to understand this, I need to have you look at the principle of precedence, which I just was talking about, as it was applied as people moved on. We need to understand that an essential experience for the Bantu is the frontier, just like Frederick Jackson Turner said for the US and the American culture that the frontier was seminal to our identity and our, the formation of our culture. This should be the same, we should look at this in the same way for the Bantu. They have 4,000 years of moving across the continent. And so that's kind of what I'm going to explain to you here with this next slide. <clears throat> These are the kind of the layout of this ideology that's behind much of it. The first comers are true, the true owners of the land. And the reason they're so important is their ancestors are buried there. If your ancestors are buried somewhere, you have right to that land. It is the spirits of those ancestors, the ancestors of the first comers, that ensure fertility and fecundity. And in an agrarian society, you must have a lot of people and a lot of food. We don't understand this with our modern economy, but this is essential to survival and wealth and just everything in an agrar agrarian society. So as the descendants of the first comer, the Batwa are considered the most apt at pleasing them, at appeasing them. And as a new person arrives, a Bantu Kumu arrives, they are required, in fact, to learn how to appease them from the first comers. So oftentimes you'll see chiefs say, I learned how to do this from my great, great ancestor. He was a pygmy. Or even the modern president of Gabon, some Gabonese oftentimes say he's a pygmy. And we in the West take that as an insult. But it, to them, that's according him a certain kind of power, a certain power that has prestige and a little bit of a fear associated with it because of that connection. So they're looking at this in a very different way than we do. The result of this type of, this layout of idea, ideas here is that over time, these ancestors of the first comers become the nature spirits. And they're associated with sacred locations and shrines where those spirits are said to be buried. These are usually in very unusual or very beautiful or kind of, uh, you know, you can go in nature and feel this kind of uh, 
this kind of spirit by being in nature. Sometimes we can get that ourselves. So these would be the types of places where people are feeling the effects of that. And the places that we find in Central Africa are caves or grottos or unusually located hills, ponds, very big termite hills. If you've ever seen in Central Africa, the termite hills are this tall and very unusual looking, and certain forest groves. And what we get from that is the Batwa end up serving as religious experts to the Bantu settlers. They teach them and guide them in the early years in how to access nature spirits. And because of this focus on fertility, fecundity, and the fullness of life, they're associated to be close, closer than the ancestors in some ways to the beneficent powers of the Supreme Creator because of this association with the land. But the political reality is, over time, the Bantu took over, and they were not... Uh, they strove to appropriate that job, that job of appeasing the nature spirits on their own. And to be legitimate, in the beginning, you had to attract the Batwa and have them work for you. But later on, the chiefs would assume that role themselves. So there is this point in history where this new type of chief is invented, and Vancina talks about it in his book, and it's called the Nkani chief, and it's the appropriation of the first comer role. He, uh, Vancina talks about it as a territorial chief. It's a new kind of chief. It's a territorial chief, not a village chief, meaning many, many villages are going to be under their rule. And Vancina describes him as a special kind of wizard with access to spirits of the land. This is an important point to understand because the power that's coming from the other world is a very powerful source. But in African or Central African belief systems, it's your intention that determines whether it's going to be malevolent or beneficent. So it's your intention as a person who can control that, how you're going to direct that. So it's not a negative. Wizard isn't really a great word to use here because they're getting a power that I call transformative through access to these other spirits, be they ancestor or nature spirits. And it is your intention that determines this. The Nkani chief rises up after the introduction of bananas and iron, and they have a certain regalia associated with it. And one of them is a thing called a bell, the king's bells. And we see that archaeologically showing up very regularly, and it moves south too. So that's very clear evidence that this new type of chiefship was spreading. As it came about, people competed and adopted it and spread it. So we... In this situation where a territorial chief is taking charge, the real first comers have to be relegated to a kind of ritual role. And this is why we see them in the roles they are today, where they're kind of called forth to be present at the ceremony, but actually have no real power in the socioeconomic and cultural systems that really rule the region at this point. So if we have political religious powers um, laying in the hands of Bantu, we have the chiefs, but the Bantu went ahead and created another category of internal other folks who could serve as intercessors to those nature spirits also. And this is what we're, what's really interesting for me as far as arguing my take on what this reliquary statue is looking, is uh, representing. So they create this category, many of these cultures, in fact most of them, of internal others to play this role to access the nature spirits. And the chief could have been one, but another category is individuals who are born under very unusual circumstances. For example, in, um, infants who are born breech, infants with, born with cord around their neck, infants born with missing limbs. They say that the limb is left in the other world, so they have a special attachment to that other part of, of the universe. Um, infants or individuals exhibiting um, sexual bimorphism, hermaphrodites, because they're encompassing that male-female gender in one. Albinos, people born with the lighter skin, they're associated with the other world, as you've seen today. The white is the color of the ancestors. And dwarves, or what we call in the U.S., little people, are relegated to this category, too. And in that sense, they're associated with these myths of the primordial batwa, the primordial pygmies. Now, I have to say to you that I've seen lots and lots of batwa pygmies, and their bodies are not in the form of someone who's affected by dwarfism. They're very perfectly proportional. But we in the West have done this, and the Africans have done this too, where we get confused and meld the two ideas of a short-statured forest dweller with uh, someone who's affected by the condition of dwarfism. <clears throat> 